Yeah, as the second part of this double act, I will uh, just move the focus a bit further down south um, to the southwestern part of Jotland um, and the settlement site from the early Iron Age seen, seen here on the map. My intention with this paper is to give a status, a status of our knowledge on the households and local communities in uh, the early Iron Age, Western Jotland. Primarily, it's based on my own work done some years ago uh, from uh, recently excavated set sites on Vardy uh, Bagu, the one you see there on the right. But I will also draw on the results of some magnificent work done by Leo Webley on some of the better preserved sites on long established uh, uh, excavations. Um, the questions I want to ask are fairly basic. Who are the persons we find huddled around the heart of individual houses? And what are the relationships uh, between different households? Now, I would have liked to answer both those questions, but unfortunately, my second point with this paper it will be to outline how much work we still have to do if we want to gain a, a more detailed insight into the early Iron Age households and daily life. A bit of background knowledge is called for here, even though Nils almost, almost presented it all uh, just a minute ago. In the 1920s and 30s, excavations were undertaken on individual houses still visible on the surface in the heathlands. These houses, such as the one uh, seen here on, on the left, contain an immense amount of information due to the preserved cultural layers. Um, but present day uh, Danish landscape is heavily agriculturalized, uh, and more and more land were taken on the plough in the first half of the, the 20th century. So, uh, a present day settlement archaeology has to rely primarily on dug in evidence such as post holes, trenches, and pits found below the subsoil. I think Nils has been digging one of the uh, four sites basically where we have this turf like structure that has been excavated during the last 30 years or something like that in Denmark. And from the 1960s onwards, onwards most settlements have been excavated using machinery. The development <coughs> has its advantages with the possibility of excavating large areas, whole micro-regions, and entire settlements of the, of the local communities, with extensive excavations and trial trenching, as seen here in, in Espian. But the development has been, uh, not been advancing our understanding of uh, minute details of daily life within the house and farmstead. Just to give you an idea uh, of the differences in settlement uh, uh, materials, here you see a house from Sjelpon with preserved heart, mortar stone and stone pavement, basically like the, the ones that Nils has presented. Um, compared to a house from Mullemark's Skor uh, without a, a cultural layers, indeed I think I've got two pottery shirts from that, that's uh, all I've got except for the, the structure in itself. In Western Jotland, only 3% of all excavated settlements have preserved cultural layers. So we have to rely heavily on results from a very limited number of well-preserved houses to gain a better insight into household activities. <coughs> and thus we have to be fairly cautious when exploring uh, uh, concepts of daily life and domestic activities. As mentioned before, the long houses uh, are the core element uh, throughout the Neolithic, Bronze Age and Iron Age in Denmark. The Iron Age long houses are all clearly divided into three parts. An entrance area in the middle with opposing doors, uh, living quarters at one end with the heart sometimes preserved. Um, in the rare instances of these burnt down, uh, well preserved houses, we find smashed pottery in situ together with fire dogs, coins, and so on. At the other end of the house, we find the buyer with impressions of uh, partitioning walls uh, between the stalls. In the, uh, the well-preserved houses, we find a, a elaborate stone pavement, and uh, under the lucky circumstances, we may even find bones from livestock that was trapped inside a burning house. Um, lucky, uh, at least for us, not so much for the livestock or owner, obviously. <laughs> so by the look of it, each Iron Age longhouse represents one indiv individual economic unit, a unit with its own livestock, shelter for its members, and the preparation of food taking place uh, at the heart, and domestic activities that are clearly uh, separated from those of, uh, those of other similar units. Basically, the Iron Age longhouse seems to represent and embody one household. 
Between the 5th and 3rd centuries BC, most of these longhouses are fairly small. They're only 10 to 12 meters long. Though a small percentage of the houses are almost twice that size. No matter the size, the houses from the early pre-Roman Iron Age uh, all seem to have been abandoned after a single generation with a complete abandonment of the old ha house site. Even their principal posts are fairly small and there are no signs of rebuilding the same house in close proximity or replacing posts throughout the lifetime of this house. And no matter the size, the houses from this period all follow the st same strict layout. They all orientated east-west with the buyer to the east and in case uh, of differences in terrain, the buyer end of the house is lower than that of the dwelling. In a few instances, uh, we even have evidence of artificially lowering the buyer in order to fit both demands of orientation and level. So the building and rebuilding of houses seems to adhere to a strict set of uh, principles governing how houses are built within the wider community. The fairly limited time the houses would have been maintained suggest that they were only built to last for a generation. This leaves us with the possibility that the life of a house and a, of, a, of the household is one and the same. Unfortunately, we don't have any examples of buried houses uh, from the pre-Roman Iron Age in Western Jutland, as we see in some other parts of uh, Scandinavia. But what we do have are a good number of houses from the 5th to 3rd, early 3rd century where large pits have, have been dug right next to the dwelling area of houses. Pits that contain uh, the complete range of pre-Roman Iron Age pottery assemblage, crone stones, and not least fire dogs. With pottery and fire dogs bearing no signs of actually being broken before they uh, were eventually discarded in, in the pits, it seems likely that the, the buried cooking utensils represent a de deliberate deposition perhaps a part of ritually uh, borrowing of a, form, former ha of a former household. So, <clears throat> during the 3rd century BC, there's a major shift in settlement density, layout, and the governing principles behind the development of households and farmsteads. Gradually, the wi widespread uh, farms of local communities contract, as seen here at Grontoft, where the widespread farms are eventually enclosed behind a common fence and the, the houses in blue marked down there. The farmsteads developed continually from the third to the first century BC. Outhouses in close connection to individual longhouses become still more common. And at the same time, the immediate surroundings of some farms are fenced off, uh, creating a small private space just in front of the longhouse. In the first century AD, the, fences, uh, the fenced off areas of the farms become more and more rectangular and in some sites, they even reflect a, a very formalized layout of the entire settlement into plots. The houses from the first century uh, BC to second century AD are built to last. The posts are now much sturdier than they were before, and many houses are completely rebuilt on exactly the same spot. At the same time, we have a growing number of small votive deposits, such as miniature vessels and uh, fossil sea urchins, found in the principal posts. The hearts are in some cases decorated, and below the hearts we have examples of broken pottery and querns uh, deposited. In especially the largest farms, we even have examples of personal belongings and status symbols uh, deposited. In the red longhouse I've shown you here, uh, the largest longhouse in this settlement, um, we have encountered a riding spur, an, an important uh, status symbol, placed exactly in the center of the heart. And right next uh, to, or within the fences of some of the larger farms, we also find either single burials, or in a few cases, uh, a small contemporary burial ground. So, as the mobility of the houses decreases, uh, the individual house and the household as an institution seems to be emphasized and commemorated, rather than buried with the death of a previous generation. They bury that, that, that previous generation next to the farm, rather than burying the house. In the centuries around the birth of Christ, we also find still greater differences in size of both the longhouse and the farmsteads, with variations in the number of outhouses, the construction of fences, and other additional structures. Within especially the larger enclosed farmsteads, we find a growing number of smaller buildings. The function of, of these have only been sporadically touched upon in much of the literature, and they are normally referred to as outhouses. 
We do, though, have signs of them be, be, being used as workshops, such as the one here at Møllemark Skov, uh, the green one, with uh, signs of some of them being used as workshop, uh, sorry, with the uh, finds indicating smithing and broadcasting. But the question arises whether some of these smaller buildings may have been used as dwellings, perhaps for non-core members of a household, perhaps a bit like uh, some of uh, Nils's smaller farms right next to, 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 to the larger ones. If we have a closer look at the smaller houses with preserved control layers, it is evident that many of these have hearts. In this example of a burnt down uh, farm from uh, Nørfjern, we have pottery for both food preparation and storage placed on the floor uh, around the heart, together with grain and processed seeds. So these small buildings could potentially be secondary dwellings within the farmstead, perhaps uh, with separate food preparation and accommodations for some, for some of the non-core members of one, house, of one of the larger households in such uh, a settlement. An important development in these centuries is the introduction of fences around individual farmsteads, an introduction that coincides with the uh, contraction of settlements. Here, one example from uh, Hesmer, fences are maintained towards an open common ground in the interior of the village, while most farms have at least not kept quite as sturdy fences to the sides away from the settlement. So most farms are not exactly encapsulated, and fences seem to be kept mainly to restrict movement and demarcate public from private space in a tightly spaced community. In the larger farmsteads, fences are maintained more rigorously, as seen here at Billum, uh, and there are even signs of elaborations around the fence openings, here seen at Mullemark Skor, where the additional posts marked uh, with blue here are most probably an elaboration of the entrance through the fence. The differences in size between farm states in the late pre-Roman and early Roman Iron Age is also uh, reflected in the overall structuration of hamlets and villages. Without going into too much detail as time is running out, uh, in the village of Harlem, the larger farms here marked in red are found at a distance from each other, with small, smaller farm steads in between, and also sheltering the larger farms from the interior public space of the village. In the smaller hamlets, this is also visible to some extent. Here are the largest farmsteads in two of these hamlets, uh, uh, marked with their uh, colours. Note how they are placed at the far end of the open common space, and how they are mirroring each other across the open public space. Basically, they can look through the, their fence openings from the in, in, interior of their houses, look through the fence openings, into the longhouse on the other side of this open cup, uh, common public space that you see here on, on, on the left, and that's more than 100 meters. Um, <clears throat> so in the centuries around uh, the birth of Christ, it is clear that the house as an institution is an important aspect of the organization of communities. Especially the long, long houses in the larger farms are continuously <coughs> repaired and rebuilt in exactly the same spot. Their fences are maintained, burial grounds are placed right next to them, and larger farms always placed at distance from each other, with the smaller farmsteads uh, and or public space in between. This weighed upon the continuity of the longhouse and household of especially the larger farms is so very different from the shifting farmsteads of the, uh, the 5th to 3rd century uh, BC. And, is, and it is to me uh, most likely the result of kinship-based community, a community where uh, the large farmstead with a long site continuity is possibly long-lasting la focal point of an extended king group, uh, with perhaps uh, smaller dependent households of the, of the king group placed in the immediate uh, uh, vicinity. So to conclude, <coughs> with the materials available um, uh, today, it is possible to trace a shift in the principles of the how households are transformed and maintained uh, in the early Iron Age Western Jotland. And we are making significant advances on the relationships between the households. But if we are to get a better understanding of uh, the, the, the composition of individual households and the daily life going on in, in the houses, we still have a lot of work ahead. Uh, to get minute details of daily life in houses, we need to reevaluate the materials from the old excavations and from sites such as Nilsen's at Nertanas. Um, and we need to excavate well-preserved farmsteads 
bringing in all our new methodologies such as archaeobotany, micromorphology, geochemistry and so on on sites with preserved cultural layers. So <clears throat> with this rather inconclusive conclusion on who it is that huddles around the hearts of the houses, thank you. <laughs>